Good evening, guys. This is Coach Coop here with another episode of BHB Radio. Tonight, I have another heavyweight guest on. We have Dr. David Jockers. Dr. Jockers, whom you might already know from the space, is an integrative health doctor. Tonight, we're actually going to get into a ton of awesome topics, including everything you need to know about fasting, when to do it, when not to do it, everything uh, that it helps, different types of fasting. We're going to get into recovery. We're going to get into inflammation. We're going to get into exogenous ketones, sport performance, and a whole lot more. I'm looking forward to introducing you guys to Dr. Jockers as he and his website uh, I have learned a ton from, and I think you will too. Good evening, everyone. This is Coach Matt, and you are listening to Better Health and Body Radio, your source for the latest and greatest information and understanding in the world of health, nutrition, and performance, where we give you a seat at the table next to the best and the brightest minds to arm you with the information you need to optimize yourself. Join us for another exciting, thought-provoking episode of BHB Radio, starting now. All right, Dr. Jockers, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Absolutely, Matt. It's really an honor. appreciate what you guys are doing with this podcast, and thanks for having me as a guest. Oh, yeah, of course, of course. Now, uh, I know who you are, obviously. I've been following your work for a while. It's been really helpful for me. I'm, I'm still subscribed to this day. I'm, I think I'm going on about five or six years at this point of, of quality content that's helped me as a practitioner helping other people help me in my own practice. But for people who are listening at home who might not be as familiar, can you introduce us a little bit to you know, who you are and how you got to be doing what you're doing? Yeah, for sure. So I am a doctor of chiropractic and natural medicine. And, you know, really for me, I was always interested in health and performance. I was an athlete growing up. And uh, in my early 20s, I developed irritable bowel syndrome. So I was a personal trainer at the time. And I was eating, you know, six, seven, eight meals a day. You know, this was the early 2000s. And that was the common knowledge. And I ended up losing 30 pounds, even though I was still trying to exercise. I just had such bad gut issues that I couldn't absorb nutrients. And I would have extreme fatigue. Um, I, I had orthostatic hypotension where I go from sitting to standing and I would feel really, really dizzy. And I lost 30 pounds. I was about 165, dropped down to about 135. So I was like really, and I'm 5'11". So I was really, really thin. Wow. And um, yeah, and this is when I actually discovered intermittent fasting. This is 2005. And I noticed that when I took, when I just didn't eat in the morning and I hydrated well, that I just seemed to feel better. I had more energy and I started to gain my, my weight back. I would typically get hungry around two or three o'clock and I would eat till roughly seven o'clock. And I eat a lot of calories in that time span and I had less gut symptoms. My bowel movements were better, um, less inflammation in my body. And I just felt better in general, I was sleeping better. And I also made nutrition changes along the, you know, at that same time, I took grains out of my diet, which was a really big, you know, a big thing. Um, I, I went with organic grass fed meat products, which was harder to get back then in 2005. But, uh, mm. but you know, it was, it was a move that I felt like I needed to make. And uh, I really was looking at processed vegetable oils and taking those out. So that was actually the first thing I did. I, was, I made these nutrition changes and that definitely helped, but it wasn't until I really started intermittent fasting that I saw the big, that was like a huge change for me. And it allowed me to regain that 30 pounds. And I just felt better than ever. I was stronger. I had more energy, more endurance. And uh, you know, this is uh, over a six month period of time, I gained that weight back and just felt really, really good. And nobody was talking about fasting back in 2005, 2006. And I didn't even know it was the fasting. I actually, it's funny because I actually used to tell people, I drink a gallon of water between the time I wake up and noon. And I thought that was, you know, one of the reasons why I felt so much better. And I'm sure that helped, you know, just really filtering out my, my system, moving my bowels better draining out toxins. But, uh, you know, now I know the science, my body was really able to heal and regenerate through the fasting. Now I graduated with a degree in chiropractic. I opened a clinic on my own 2008. I couldn't get a, a business loan. I opened it on credit cards mm. and I actually lived in my clinic for two years. 
Wow. And um, until I paid off all my loans, I mean, I was $170,000 in debt. I, I worked seven days a week um, and I would be out in the weekends meeting people at health food stores and different places and giving them opportunities to come into my clinic for like a discounted exam. And I was able to build a really successful clinic, but I was working so much and just really living an imbalanced life. And I actually developed skin cancer. And I was 29 oh, wow. years old at this time. Wow. And I developed skin cancer in uh, 2011. And this is when I came across a ketogenic diet. And uh, I started applying a ketogenic diet. I did an extended fast. I did um, you know, a lot of different nutraceuticals and advanced um, natural therapies. And I was able to, to heal that skin cancer naturally. And so that was really around the time when I started my website and started putting out this information and the ketogenic diet really, uh, you know, took off. And, um, you know, later, you know, I, I've helped thousands of different clients and I later went on to sell my clinic. Um, and now I just have a really, you know, my website gets a lot of traffic and we put out a lot of content. I have a podcast myself, functional nutrition podcast. And, uh, you know, so now I'm just really focused on content creation, creating digital programs and uh, really great articles and podcast, YouTube content that helps people, uh, you know, just improve, radically improve their health. And I've also written several books uh, to do that as well. Awesome. I, I love hearing about that journey. Actually, I didn't even know about the, the skin cancer almost as a result of kind of the burnout and the life you were living at that time. Yeah. Um, Thankfully, it didn't get that serious for me, but I was presented with like a similar situation where I, I'd moved down to Southern California from up in you know, uh, comparatively slow wine country and really had to reset things up down here. And, and I noticed I was going through my own almost like quasi low, low, low level like fatigue type syndrome. Yeah. Um, and it really took a good amount of self-care to, to get out of that and, and then live a more, a more balanced life. So speaking of the yeah, fast, yeah, absolutely. Speaking of the fasting, you actually have a new book out, right? Yeah, yeah, Can it's called the Fasting it? Transformation. Yeah, and so I teach you how to how to use fasting, intermittent and extended fasting, to burn fat, to heal your body, and to transform your life. And you know, fasting is such a powerful therapy, and it, you know, I always tell people it's the most powerful, inexpensive, and ancient. Uh, nutritional strategy known to mankind. I mean, all of our ancestors practiced some level of fasting. And that was because they didn't have access to food. You know, food was uh, harder to get for our ancestors. Today's day and age, we have refrigerators and pantries. They didn't have that. So when they had food, they ha it had a short shelf life. So they had to feast. You know, when food was abundant, they ate a lot. And when food right. wasn't abundant, they ate little. And so they did this feast famine cycling and it's really inherent to our, our genetic blueprint. And there's incredible healing mechanisms that we activate when we have a nutritional lifestyle like this. And I go through that, all that in the book. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, I want to get to maybe a little bit of the recommendations for people starting who want to start mm -hmm. out with that. Um, what are some of the benefits of fasting for people who might have heard of it, but might not be familiar with the whole menu of benefits that you presented? Yes. So when we fast, the first thing that happens is we actually take stress off of our digestive system. So the digestive system, our gut lining is one cell wall. It's like a long tube, but it's only one cell that's, you know, connected to, you know, in a line basically. Whereas our skin, there's about 20 different layers of cells. And so, you know, we, when we have irritation on our skin, it takes a significant amount of irritation before we get blood, right? Before we start to bleed and we get, you know, a cut that we've got to bandage, like put a Band-Aid on and scar development. Whereas the gut, it's actually a lot less hardy. And so it's more fragile, more vulnerable. And when we're consistently eating, especially foods that cause inflammation, grains, processed vegetable oils, different toxins, pesticides, herbicides, food maybe that has... Uh, you know, high amount of bacteria, for example, or, you know, pathogenic microbes on it, parasites, all these types of things cause inflammation in our gut and they damage that gut lining. And so, you know, leaky gut is probably a term many of your listeners have heard about. And leaky gut is really at the root cause of autoimmune and chronic inflammatory conditions. And so in order to heal the gut, first thing we've got to actually do is take mechanical stress off of it. It's kind of like if you had a sprained ankle, the way to heal a sprained ankle is not to go out and run on it. 
you know, you've got to, you need low impact. You need to rest it, right? The, the common, uh, you know, therapy is rice, rest, ice, compression, elevation, right? You can definitely do some therapy, physical therapy and move it, but you're trying to take the impact, the high impact activity off of it. And it's kind of the same thing with your gut. If you're eating a lot of solid foods all throughout the day, not allowing it to rest, it's not going to heal. So this is where fasting, liquid nutrition, like doing smoothies, bone broth, things like that, things that are already broken down, put less mechanical stress on the gut and allow you to heal. So that's really the first thing. And that really reduces inflammation. Number two is we have this hormone called insulin. And insulin is a superhero hormone in the sense that it takes sugar out of the bloodstream and puts it into the cells. We know that high blood sugar is extremely toxic. In fact, when we think about somebody with diabetes with uncontrolled blood, blood sugar, they end up with things like optic neuritis where the sugar molecules actually bind to proteins and they create and they damage the nerves, right? They create these really powerful um, compounds called advanced glycation end products, AGEs, that create massive amount of oxidative stress. They damage the nerves. So they de people develop optic neuritis, peripheral neuropathy, Alzheimer's disease uh, is considered type three diabetes. It's marked by insulin resistance and this sort of glycate, glycated damage to the brain cells. Um, we also have things like kidney. You know, when we have high blood, blood sugar, it's like shrapnel going through the kidneys. So it damages the kidneys, damages the blood vessels. Most people with diabetes end up dying from kidney failure or heart disease. So insulin gets the sugar out of the bloodstream. So it doesn't elevate up and create these glycation end products. The problem though is when we have high insulin, so when we're continually elevating our blood sugar and continually elevating insulin, our body, our cells become resistant to it. And so now we get the insulin resistance and we have to produce more and more insulin when we eat. Insulin is a fat storage hormone. So it tells the body to store fat, it doesn't allow us to burn fat for fuel and it turns on inflammatory gene pathways. So it turns up inflammation. So the best way to get inflammation down, or really the, the best way to get insulin down, um, inflammation and insulin are really synonymous. When we have high insulin, we're gonna have high inflammation. So, so important to, to get this under control. And the best way to do that is to not eat, to fast. Fasting allows us to not have to produce insulin and have, a, our, have elevated insulin in our bloodstream. And therefore our hormone receptors are able to heal. So our cell membranes are now able to heal and the receptors become more sensitive to insulin. And that's important because we do need insulin and when we eat, we want our, our cells to be very insulin sensitive. So we don't have to produce a lot and we're able to get the glucose and other nutrients into the cell. Insulin also drives things like magnesium, amino acids, key nutrients into the cell so they can be used. And if we're resistant to insulin, we're not, we're going to, our cells are going to actually be deficient in key nutrients they need. So we need that insulin sensitivity. Fasting is amazing for enhancing, enhancing insulin sensitivity. And by doing that, it also turns on fat burning because when our blood sugar and our insulin go down, our body says, okay, we need to use fat, all this stored energy for fuel. So it starts burning fat and it also creates ketones. Ketones are a water soluble molecule that's produced from fat and it's produced in the liver. And the reason why we make ketones is that fatty acids themselves, although they're a great fuel source for muscle cells, um, you know, other, other different uh, organ cells of our body, they can't cross the blood brain barrier. So we need a smaller molecule that's water soluble to cross the blood brain barrier. So we create ketones. Ketones are a great fuel for the brain. They're very, very metabolically dense, meaning that they were able to produce significant amount of energy from ketones or from fat when we're, when we're burning fat for fuel. And we produce a lot less metabolic waste than when we're burning glucose or sugar for fuel. So it's like a car that gets great gas mileage and has incredible performance and the lowest carbon emissions. It's kind of like your ideal vehicle. And that's what happens when we're burning fat and ketones as our primary fuel source. When we're fasting, that's what we're doing. And then on top of that, we activate something called autophagy. And autophagy means self-eating. And basically, our body has this natural, innate internal repair system, meaning that 
our cells and within our cells, we have all of these key organelles, right? So just like we have organs in our body, like our heart and our stomach, within a cell, we have key organelles like the mitochondria, the Golgi apparatus, endoplasmic reticulum. The mitochondria is probably the most well-known. That's what we, where we produce all the energy, the cellular energy. And so over time, because the process of metabolism, creating energy creates, also creates oxidative stress. And oxidative stress is a waste product that will damage the different organelles. So that's wear and tear on them. And over time, these organelles get older and uh, less functional. They become dysfunctional. And so autophagy is a natural way of basically breaking down the dysfunctional organelles using the raw materials to form new healthy organelles. So when it comes to the mitochondria, we call it mitophagy, where we have uh, an enzyme within the, the cell called the lysozyme that actually metabolizes the damaged, the old mitochondria. And then again, we, we take those raw materials, we form a new mitochondria. So it's like recycling itself. And this is really energy conserving process. And uh, it's, it's an incredible anti-aging process that helps reduce our risk of chronic disease. In 2016, a Japanese researcher won the Nobel Prize for really finding a lot, a lot of new discoveries. We already knew about autophagy, but he really discovered a lot of um, key mechanisms that drive autophagy. And so it's, it's been a really exciting thing to study, this concept of autophagy. We only, we only uh, get into a state of autophagy when our insulin is low. So again, fasting is the best driver for autophagy. There are other things. Exercise helps drive autophagy. Um, exercise in a fasting state can really help drive autophagy. There are certain herbs uh, and compounds, even coffee, chlorogenic acid that's in the coffee helps drive autophagy. Things like uh, epigolactic attechins uh, or EGCG within green tea, curcumin within turmeric, um, carnosinic acid within things like rosemary and oregano. A lot of these herbs, quercetin, help drive autophagy as well. Heat therapy like infrared sauna or cold therapy will drive heat and cold shock proteins that can um, initiate autophagy as well. But really having a good process of autophagy, which is self, basically cell cleansing, along with cell building. So this is why in the book, I talk a lot about feast famine cycling. So when we eat, it's really important that we eat really well, right? We eat till we're satiated. We're not trying to like count calories or anything like that. We're eating till we're fully satiated, but then we take a break and we take a long period of time between meals or we condense our eating window where we're only eating, you know, in let's say a six hour eating window or an eight hour eating window on a daily basis. And that's where we get a lot of these benefits. Interesting. Yeah. It's, you know, it, I appreciate you saying that last part, especially because I myself went through a period where I was, I was doing intermittent fasting and then uh, we can get into different fasting protocols in a sec here, but I was also in a caloric deficit most of the days, and I was, you know, having a very low amount of carbohydrates, and I felt like I maybe didn't do a great job of walking both lines and saying, like, all right, if I'm going to have the hormetic stress on my body of, you know, or a positive good stress for people who are listening, I, I felt like if I was going to, you know, pull one lever strongly there, I maybe didn't balance that out enough, and so I, I was left feeling almost like a little bit burnt out. So you're saying when you do eat, it's important to eat well and eat enough, right? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a time and a place for a partial fast. And a partial fast would be like a three to maybe seven day period of time where you're intentionally under eating calories, usually 40% of your daily caloric needs or less. So for the average person, they need about 2000 calories. So on a partial fast, you're usually consuming somewhere around three to 500, maybe up to 800 calories, um, you know, a day for, again, maybe three to 10 days at most. Some popular partial fasts are things like a bone broth fast or a juice fast, which, you know, that, that can be very, very common. A lot of people will do that. Um, there's also something called the fasting mimicking diet that was developed by Walter Longo. He is a... Uh, really well-known researcher in the fasting world. And uh, he showed, he's shown that doing this, and he recommends a five-day partial fast, 
doing this sort of fast for a five day period of time. And typically on a partial fast, you want to keep your carbohydrate intake down and also your protein intake down. Um, we'll activate autophagy. It's almost like doing an extended water fast. Um, and you're getting a lot of the same benefits, activate stem cell development, um, getting the ketones up, all those great benefits. But you don't want that to happen for a long period of time. You need to refeed after that. If your body feels like it's in a fat, a uh, caloric deprivation for an extended period of time, then it's going to lower its metabolic rate. It's going to, you're going to have less activation of key hormones like thyroid hormone. You're not going to convert into your active T3. For men, their testosterone is going to go down. For women, their estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone will go down. You just won't feel as good. So when you eat, you need to eat well, right? You got to get your calories in. And then when you fast, you fast, right? You're, you're under eating or you're you know, just not eating anything at all. So like on a daily basis, you might fast, for example, for 16 hours. You might finish your dinner at 8 p.m. the night before, and then you fast and you just drink water, herbal tea, maybe black coffee, something like that until let's say 12 p.m. the next day or 2 p.m. if you want to push it to like an 18-hour fast. So you're fasting and then you eat your meal and you're eating a really, really good meal that is providing a lot of good calories until you're satiated. And then you may eat, you know, three or four hours later, another meal, you know, and then again, go back into your fasting period after that. So it's this feast famine cycling that's going to really help you get the best benefits because feasting helps activate, obviously helps increase insulin and insulin activates thyroid hormone. And it also brings nutrients that we need within the cell. And on top of that, it helps boost key sex hormones like testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, but getting the, the benefit of both, right? Getting that self-cleansing and the hormone receptor repair, right? That I talked about with like insulin sensitivity from the fast, along with a boost of your insulin uh, when you're eating, that combination is really a sweet spot for optimal health. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. You, you hit on a few good things there. And uh, you know, I, I wanted to loop back on something that like, it, it was like a little dot got connected for me. A, a friend of mine out here, acquaintance of mine, Dylan in the LA area, he, he was, you know, he's, he's like a, a practitioner himself. He was actually having some folks follow various diets on the keto uh, spectrum, we'll say, or low carb, high fat spectrum, probably a better way to put it. And one of his ways of circumventing having to do maybe like several, you know, days in a row where you're maybe low carb, uh, you're, you're maybe also for some of these people doing a caloric deficit, maybe a majority of the days was he at the end of the day would, would do something called hedonic response. And it was his way of trying to help the body get signaled to itself that you weren't trying to kill it. And then also that it wasn't in an ultra deep survivalist state. So he would sort of finish off the day with his little, or have people finish off the day with their little carb allotments, um, and then have some fruit in there, a bit of, uh, I believe it was cream and then just a few squares of dark chocolate, not enough to, in his case with, with what he was trying to do, kick you out of ketosis, but just some things that sort of like will, will release a little bit of, will kill a little bit of the stress hormones in the body. And then, um, kind of try to trigger that. I always myself had just sort of done what I'd called calorie cycling. And then I'd had myself and then other people basically just, you know, eat a bigger caloric surplus when they maybe needed the fuel for recovery. Let's say with, you know, someone who is on, on like sprinting on a day like that or doing some uh, fast twitch dominant training, right? Like some sort of like weightlifting or something like that. And then on a day where they didn't need that caloric surplus, which is like at least half, if not more of the days during the week for, for me would, would be like a, maybe a lower carbohydrate day, right? If I'm just resting or just walking when I'm mainly using that oxidative or fat burning pathway. So does that, is that making sense? It's sort of like giving yourself maybe like a little bit less of a survival state or lower carb or low, excuse me, lower calorie state when, when you need it, when you do need those extra agents for recovery and then being able to sort of surf that line and then, you know, go lower uh, in calories, lower in carbs when you're, when you don't need them as well. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, exactly. You want to stress the body 
I think that's a key component to it. So fasting is a stressor on the body and it's actually the stressor that activates the autophagy mechanism, but you don't want to overwhelm the body. It's kind of like exercise. We all know, you know, everybody knows that exercise is good for you, but if you exercise too much for too long, you're overtraining your system. So rest is extremely important. Rest and recovery is extremely important to getting the best fitness benefits. It's the same thing metabolically when it comes to fasting. So we want to fast uh, for periods of time. So we may have days where, you know, we're calorically restricted uh, or just a period of time during the day where we're calorically restricted. And then days where we have a caloric surplus or at least a period of time during the day when we have a caloric surplus. For example, like for me, I usually do two days a week. So I, I typically work out five days a week. And on those days, I eat a lot. So like I, my body typically needs about 3,000 calories a day. But on my workout days, I'm usually consuming about 3,500 calories. And then on my non-workout days, those two days a week, I'm usually consuming roughly around uh, 1,500 to 2,000 calories, right? So usually eat like one meal those days. Mm. And so I'm kind of cycling between, okay, I'm in caloric deprivation here. Now I'm exercising, really stressing my body, but then also getting a caloric surplus, right? To really refuel my system. And I found that that seems to work really, really good uh, mm. as a whole. Now, you know, obviously everybody's going to do their own thing. And in the book, I talk about a whole, a whole number of different fasting strategies, and it really depends on your goal. It also depends on your, your, what we call your fasting fitness level. So just like exercise, when you first start, if your goal is to um, run, you know, we'll just use this example, run a 5K, but you have been sedentary for the last six months, you don't just go out and run a 5K. You could, but you'll be really sore the next day. You'd be really uncomfortable. So what you're going to do, you might walk a mile, right? And then the next, you know, and then you just train up. So you, you gradually use progressive overload to strengthen your body and to improve its fitness. Well, it's the same with fasting. If you've never fasted before, I always recommend starting with a 12-hour simple fast. And it actually really is simple because it's kind of like finishing your dinner at 7 p.m., and then you don't consume anything with calories until 7 a.m. the next morning. That's actually really easy. You know, it's really more so being mindful. Um, mm -hmm. And that's really what it increases is your mindfulness. A lot of people are eating right before they went to they go to bed and then they wake up in the morning and immediately they feel like they need to eat. So 12-hour simple fast is where we start. Then I recommend really making it a great practice in the morning of hydrating your body really well. I recommend 16 to up to 32 ounces of water in the morning before you even think about food. All of us are dehydrated when we first wake up and that's because we've been breathing out water vapor all night. Mm. So we really need to hydrate. So getting good water, you can put lemon in your water if you want. Um, you can drink herbal teas, which I really like to do. You can put a little bit of salt in your water as well, a little bit of electrolytes or um, you know, just some sea salt or something like that. And that can actually really, really help. Um, and so those are all great strategies, but the water does a couple things. Number one is it really provides, you know, water and electrolytes are what drive energy, you know? And so when our, in our body, you know, it's, it's really our nervous system. We're, we're hydroelectric beings. Our nervous system needs water and it needs electrolytes in order to run and operate really well. So we provide that when we are hydrating like that. Hydro, good hydration also helps us move our bowels which is really important for good energy because if our bowels, if our feces is sitting in our colon, uh, it's just going to rot and putrefy. We really want to move food through our system, uh, you know, within certainly within 24 hours. So if, you know, if I, whatever I ate for lunch yesterday, I want to be out of my system by lunch the next day. So good hydration in the morning really helps with that. Our large intestine is most active between 6 a.m. and 9 a.m. So we're going to get the best quality bowel movements between that time. So hydrating in the morning really helps that process. On top of that, a lot of people will tell me they're hungry in the morning. That that's a common thing. And if you're used to eating a big breakfast, then it's you're going to be hungry in the morning because you've trained your body to be that way. We have a hunger hormone called ghrelin that our stomach releases. Ghrelin is a conditioned hormone. So it, it gets released whenever there is nothing in our stomach. So it, it's, it's um, 
very much uh, controlled by the stretch receptors in our stomach. And then also on top of that, by nutrient timing, by the time of day when we're usually consuming meals. So if you've been eating big breakfasts for a while, then ghrelin gets released in the morning around the time when you normally eat that big breakfast. So if you hydrate well, you drink the water, now you're going to extend, you're going to stretch the stomach, you're going to, you're going to inhibit the ghrelin from being released and telling your brain you're hungry. So it saves off hunger and makes it very easy to fast longer. So then it's pretty easy to, to, to push your fast to 14 hours and maybe even 16 hours or 18 hours, right? So you might even be able to push your fast till you know 10 a.m., 12 p.m., 2 p.m., and over time, your body will just get better and better at doing this. And especially if you feed really well when you go through your feeding window. So that means, you know, you eat really good quality foods and you eat them till you're satiated when you do start eating. So in general, um, I think you really get good benefits on a daily basis when you're able to fast for 16 to 18 hours on a daily basis. I think that's where you know, a lot of the great benefits come. Now, if you're really trying to, uh, lose weight and get a lot, of, a lot of fat burning. A lot of people will do a four hour eating window or even do one meal a day where they're just only eating one meal and let's say like a one hour eating window. And so these are all strategies that I talk about in the book and how to apply them. Because if you're only eating one meal or if you're eating two meals in a you know, short window and you're eating larger meals, there are some things you need to do in order to prep your digestive system so you can produce the digestive juices you need so that the food doesn't become an inflammatory agent, right? It's not, uh, you're not eating so much that you're driving up inflammation in your system. And so I go through all of those strategies in the book. Interesting. Yeah, that, that's great. You actually, before I even was going to ask, uh, you touched on it. I was going to ask, what some protocols were just simple for people that, that want to get started. And it sounds like a, a 16 to 18 hour intermittent fasting window is, is what you would recommend. And that would be a 16 or 18 hour fasting window. And then the remaining hours be a feeding window. So that would be like a, a 12 to 8 PM roughly. Right. Yeah. I think that's a great window to have. Now I will tell you the the hardest demographic uh, is your very lean, active, menstruating females who also are very busy. So they're under, they're, they have a lot of stressors on their system. Number one, women who are, men, who are in their menstrual season, right? So they're in their reproductive ages. If they're lean and they have low body fat, the body itself is very, very sensitive. And so if we start doing longer fasts in that state, that could shut down menstruation and shut down sex hormone production. A lot of times these women end up with uh, HPA axis dysfunction, HPT, where they have thyroid dysfunction as well. So one thing that I'll start with for that demographic is what we call a crescendo fast, where we're doing like a 12 to 14 hour fast most days, but two days a week, non-consecutive days, we're doing a 16 to 18 hour fast. So non-consecutive days would be like Monday and Friday, for example. And in the beginning, we do it on a non-workout day, days where they're not exercising at a high intensity. They can go out and walk, do low intensity stuff, but no high intensity exercise. I want them to get good at that. That's really the first step. Let's get really good at the crescendo fast. And that's because we're not stacking these stressors. So once we get a higher level of fasting fitness, we're more metabolically flexible and energy efficient, which is the goal. We want to get there. Once we get there, now we can start to stack where we can do a 16 hour fast, work out right at the end of the 16 hour fast, do a high intensity workout, and then start refueling after that, right? We're stacking the stressors there. You know, I even will do like a 16 to 18 hour fast or even like a 24 hour fast workout and then take a cold shower. So now I'm activating, you know, I'm getting the, the cold therapy in too. So I'm stacking these stressors. But, you know, I make sure that I've rested well, that my body's in a good state before I do that. Because again, we don't want to overwhelm the system with stress. So for those young um, menstruating females who are very lean as it is, you know, we'll do a crescendo fast. If, you're, if you tend to be overweight, usually you're going to do better after like the first week or two, you know, there's an adaptation period where it can be a little uncomfortable in the beginning, but usually you're going to do pretty well 
getting uh, into that 16 to 18 hour fast. And most people say that they feel so much better um, doing that once they get into the rhythm of it. However, again, that menstruating female that's very lean, very low in body fat, that's one that we do have to be careful with. Of course, there are some other people, you know, like pregnant women that, you know, I'm not, we're not doing anything more than like a 12 hour fast with them. They can typically do a 12 hour, but, you know, beyond that, they really need to be feeding because they're really trying to grow. Um, and that's super important. And then, so, you know, young kids, athletes that are doing three to four hour, three to four hours of training and competition on a daily basis. You know, these are athletes, these are people that, during those seasons should not be doing, you know, any sort of, right. uh, you know, pushing their, their, their intermittent fasting window. Right. Right. That makes yeah, that makes a ton of sense and actually goes along with the logic that, um, people like Dr. Ray Pete and like, who, you know, but like myself, yeah. use with my clients as well. It's just sort of like making sure your global, you know, stress bucket is not too, too high or, or just managing your body. I always say it's like a, it's like a yeah. bank account, right? You got to have a certain amount of green or deposits, you know, as you said, rest, you know, things like that right. with the, with the stress. And when you do want to have stress, you want to choose it wisely, right? The, an appropriate kind of, you know, training intensity and volume and an appropriate kind of uh, fasting. If you're going to do that. Um, I want to be respectful. Uh, absolutely. Of, yeah. Uh, I want to be respectful. Yeah, and, and with athletes, what, what a big thing that I'm a fan of is, applying intermittent fasting and maybe even a partial fast or an extended fast during the off season. Right. So yes. if you're somebody like LeBron James, you're in your, you know, your NBA season, you're not even thinking about that. Right. Um, however, he's got like two months in the off season and, you know, during that first month, it's a big, he usually is not training. He's not training intensely because he's just allowing his body to rest and recover. Great time period to do a partial fast, do intermittent fasting on a daily basis, or maybe even like a three or five day water fast to really get rid of all the dysfunctional muscle cells, uh, joint cells that have been damaged from all the stress he's been under. So the body can now rebuild stronger, healthier muscle cells, stronger, healthier, uh, you know, cartilage, joint structure, all of that kind of stuff. So the body will get, that's the innate great thing about the body's intelligence. It will get rid of the damaged dysfunctional cells, no matter where they're at in the body and utilize the materials there to rebuild new, healthy, strong embryonic stem cells. And uh, it's a powerful natural therapy that we can tap into with fasting. Awesome. Yeah. That's actually what I was going to say is I know LeBron earlier in the off season tends to follow a more strict paleo ketogenic esque diet. Uh, John Wall did the same thing in his uh, yeah. rehab process to, to, you know, silence inflammation. Mark Gasol, big on intermittent fasting. Um, and then they, you know, a lot of them, because they're in, in having a higher demand of their body in the season, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll knock that off, basically. Um, I want to be respectful of your time. We've had an amazing deep dive in fasting. We've, we've touched a bit on ketosis, ketones. Um, I was going to ask, what, what are your, what's your take on exogenous ketones and, you know, not only getting the benefits of fasting endogenous, or excuse me, the benefits of ketones endogenously, but also exogenously as well. Yeah, I think exogenous ketones can be a great tool, great tool for athletes for sure. Um, you know, when you're running off those ketones, again, I talk, like I talked about earlier, they're a f uh, amazing super fuel for your brain and your body. They produce rampant amounts of cellular energy and very little metabolic waste. So teaching your body to use those is powerful. So for athletes, they can be an incredible tool uh, to sustain performance and for recovery. People have less oxidative stress that, you know, if they're, if you're LeBron James or whoever it is, and you're out there competing at a high level, if you're only burning glucose, uh, you know, you're going to have a lot of oxidative stress, a lot of lactic acid formation and more tissue damage. And if you're able to run off ketones, you are going to have a lot less of that. So fantastic for athletes. Also really good for people that are first trying to get keto adapted when they're mm -hmm. first trying to improve their metabolic flexibility. Like I mentioned, it can be uncomfortable. So taking some exogenous ketones during your fasting window uh, can actually really help. Now, it, it, it takes a, a little bit of the benefits away from the fasting, but it will help you build your fasting fitness level faster and it will make it more comfortable. And it's very important to ha have people 
have a good experience with fasting because just like anything, if you have a bad experience with something, you're much less likely to, to go back to it. So taking some exogenous ketones in the early stages can really provide that fuel source for the brain. So when your blood sugar and your insulin go down, your body's already got that fuel source. It takes a little bit of time to actually get good at burning ketones for an energy source if you're not already previously keto adapted. So exogenous ketones can really provide that fuel source and help flood the system with ketones and get some of those in the brain so you don't feel like you've got brain fog and have keto flu and you know other unwanted symptoms, irritability and things like that that people experience when they go hypoglycemic. So it can be really good there. It also, they also can help reduce cravings. So if people that have emotional overeating, um, you know, that are really driven by cravings, exogenous ketones have been shown to reduce cravings. They have also been shown to improve insulin sensitivity. So, you know, for many different reasons there, they're really good. Now, I don't want somebody to have to rely on exogenous ketones. I'd like for them to be able to produce ketones and utilize them, you know, from their own body fat. However, again, they can be a great performance tool for somebody to, to get into that state. Yeah, absolutely. I think very well said. So um, where can people find out more uh, about you and your work and, and your book if, if, if they, you know, their interest is peaked? Yeah, my website's drjockers.com. You can find me there as well as my my. my uh, podcast, Dr. Jocker's Functional Nutrition Podcast. I'm also on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Just look for Dr. Jockers. Awesome. Yeah. And I could, everybody listening at home, honestly, like I said, I've been subscribed and following Dr. Jocker's work for several years now. It's helped evolve my own understanding on many things as a practitioner and also in my own health too. So at every level, there's, there's something in there for you. He's incredibly thorough and talks about not just some of the nutrition related items we talked about today, but also um, genetics, sleep, recovery, so on and so forth. So highly recommend checking that out. And the name of the book, one more time for everyone. Yeah, it's called The Fasting Transformation, How to Use Intermittent and Extended Fasting to Burn Fat, Heal Your Body, and Transform Your Life. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I'll definitely be checking that out. All right, Dr. Jockers, thank you so much for uh, coming on. Uh, hopefully we can connect again in the future. Sounds great, Matt. Thanks so much for your time. It's an honor. Awesome. All right, everybody. That was an awesome episode. I, I know I've been taking notes, as I'm sure many of you have. Uh, we appreciate you inviting us into your homes once again, and we look forward to bringing you the next episode of BHB Radio. <laughs>